Hello, and welcome back to The Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and as always, I'm glad you decided to spend some of your time today listening to me talk about military history. This time, we're going to continue our look at the combat career of the Brewster Buffalo Fighter, specifically that part of its career in which it served with the Finns against the Soviets. Before we get back into that, I'd like to thank you all for watching, for the subscriptions and likes and all that. It makes me happy to realize that this is the kind of thing you all enjoy, because I really enjoy making these. As always, sources for information for this video can be found in the description, along with my Patreon, if you'd like to help me justify the time to make more videos. So with that out of the way, let's return to the story. At the end of March, the 3rd Flight of Squadron LLV-24 was relocated south to Imola to provide support to the Finnish Army's offensive towards the Hapaharet Islands, and then on to Sursari and Gogland. These islands, off the southern shore of the Gulf of Finland, were temporarily joined to the mainland by the thick winter ice, across which units of the Finnish army would approach. This attack began in the last days of the month. It brought to an end a three-week period of quiet in the air, as the new advance was targeted by Soviet bombers and attack aircraft. Combat was soon joined above the frozen sea, just after dawn on the 28th. Six Finnish fighters, led by Lieutenant Osmo Kaupinen, ran into ten Soviet aircraft in the area of the icebound islands. They were I-153s equipped for a strike mission, carrying rocket projectiles on racks beneath the lower wings. These older biplane fighters, like the contemporary monoplane I-16s, were often used for ground attack missions. Warrant Officer Ilmari Jutalainen was one of the Finnish pilots that found them. He describes his part in the battle in these words, quote, I flew as part of the top patrol with Sergeant Huotari. Over the Surakala shoreline at Gogland, we observed enemy fighters beneath us and dived down to attack. I singled out an I-153 and shot at it several times from a distance of 50 meters till the fighter suddenly rolled over on its back at a height of 200 meters and crashed into the ice. Sergeant Huotari and I then chased two I-153s to Lavansari, where I sent a second machine down in flames, crashed into the western shoreline of Surakhyla. Russian aircraft fired rocket projectiles at our Brewsters, creating a large, black, heavy, flak-like cloud when they detonated. The rockets exploded 100 to 200 meters ahead of my airplane. The I-153s carried four such rockets under both wings. His two victories in this action brought Jutalainen's total career score to 22 air-to-air -air victories. 20 of which had been one flying the 239. This achievement earned him Finland's highest military decoration, the Mannerheim Cross, which was awarded on April 26. He was the first, but not the only member of LLV 24 to be so honored. While the attack on Sursari progressed, more clashes between Finnish fighters and Russian attack planes took place, but the Finns retained air superiority over the ice, and this contributed to the speedy success of the drive. Another consequence was that more of LLV 24's pilots became aces. These included Lieutenant Hans Wind, who, along with Lieutenant Ika Toronen, ran into a group of R 5s near Povetsa Pelyaki on the 29th. The Russian biplanes scattered and ran for home, but not all of them made it. Each of the 239 pilots shot down an R 5 in this uneven combat. The next day, it was the turn of Sergeant Haimo Lampi. It was part of an eight-plane formation from the second flight, flying from Teeks Jarvi. This base had recently been bombed and strafed by air units of the Soviet Baltic Sea Fleet, but no significant damage had been done. On the 30th, Lampy's formation was sweeping towards the enemy bases in reply when it tangled with a dozen hurricanes from the 152nd Fighter Regiment, a unit that was a frequent antagonist of LLV-24. This Soviet formation had been established in December of 1939, at which time it was flying biplane I-15. The next year, it changed these out for another biplane, the I-153, which it used until it was issued Lend-Lease Hurricanes in November 1941. The regiment was part of the 258th Fighter Division, a component of the aviation assigned to the 14th Army. It would fly the Hurricane until 1944, and it would be exchanged for another Lend-Lease fighter, the American Curtis P-40 Warhawk, which it would use as late as 1947. On this day, the Finns found the Russian fighters to the northeast of Petrozavodsk, caught them by surprise, 
claiming six to eight of them shot down with no loss of themselves. Lampe notes in his combat report a commonly seen behavior of the Russian aircraft in this theater, quote, We had fought with some 12 hurricanes in total, and during the initial phase of the engagement, they had held their own. However, once they attempted to disengage and head for home, they did not even bother maneuvering in order to throw off our aim. Their sole intent was to reach their base as quickly as possible. This, in turn, made them easy targets. The failure of Soviet pilots to engage in evasive maneuvers or other counteraction during combat was reported again and again by Finnish pilots. It is sometimes said that Soviet training and discipline hindered the ability of Soviet airmen to act on their own initiative, and this made them hesitant to take even obvious measures of self-preservation without explicit orders. It seems more likely to me that incidents such as these are the result of pilots who were thrown into combat with inadequate training time, while still relatively unfamiliar with their aircraft. The idea of the Soviet airman as an unthinking technician without tactical initiative grows out of the propaganda images of communism in the 30s. And instances of inept response to attack or of aircraft failing to respond at all are hardly limited to Soviet units. As mentioned in the previous episode, maintenance of the Brewsters was becoming more difficult as time went on. As the supply of replacement parts for their American-made planes and their cyclone engines had dried up abruptly with the Finnish alignment with the Germans. Some of the Soviet planes the Finns faced were equipped with license-built copies of the cyclone, and parts or whole engines from these were adapted. In other cases, simple solutions were improvised to keep the 239s in the air. One example of this was connected with the tendency of the model of cyclone used in the Brewster to overheat at high power settings. Finnish mechanics solved this persistent difficulty by the simple expedient of inverting one of the piston rings on each of the engine's cylinders. This measure, along with the prevailing cold weather in this theater of operations, virtually eliminated this problem. Another major problem noted with the Brewster elsewhere, the weakness of its main undercarriage members, does not seem to have troubled the Finns, or at least they make no mention of it. This was a difficulty mostly encountered in carrier operations, or by the later, heavier models of the fighter. It appears that the comparatively lightweight 239 model, operating from land bases, suffered no special problems with its landing gear. The return of relatively moderate weather brought an increase in the tempo of operation. Much of this took place in the northern sector of LLV-24's deployment in the area of Teeks Jarvi and the second flight. The engagement at the end of March also marks the point at which the hurricane, which equipped the fighter regiments opposite the Olenets and to the north, becomes a frequent opponent of the squadron. At low altitude, the Brewster 239 was an even match for the models of the hurricane that were appearing in Soviet hands. It was more agile, better in the vertical plane, and more capable of rapid increases or decreases in the application of its engine power. Depending on the gun loadout of the particular hurricane involved, it could also have the advantage in terms of range and hitting power. On the other hand, if the hurricane was fitted with 12.7mm or 20mm weapons, it could have the edge in firepower. The real difference between the two planes, and the reason that the Brewster was considered obsolete despite its good performance here, showed at higher altitudes. Above 5,000 meters, or about 16,000 feet, the hurricane had a clear and decisive edge. Such was the pace of aircraft development in the mid-1930s that an aircraft only slightly more modern than the Buffalo could have such an expanded range of capability in comparison. Luckily for the Finns, the great majority of the combat here as elsewhere along the Eastern Front took place at low altitude. Despite this advantage of the British-made fighter, it was unpopular with its Russian pilots, who found it underpowered, clumsy, and despite the 12 303 machine guns of the models they were receiving, poorly armed. This poor estimation was probably confirmed on April 6th, when 18 drawn from the 609th and 767th fighter regiments scored a force of seven DB-3 bombers from the 80th Bomber Aviation Regiment on a mission to hit the Finnish airbase at Tixjarvi. Eight of LLV-24's Brewsters were already in the air nearby, returning from a patrol in the Belomorsk area. They were redirected to intercept the oncoming Russians, which had been reported by Finnish ground observers. They caught the raiders 20 kilometers from their target, 
over the coast of Lake Rukajarvi in cloudy skies. The Finns split up, six of the 239s heading in to tackle the fighters, while the remaining pair went after the bombers. The Finns totally dominated the numerically superior Russians, shooting down two of the bombers and no fewer than a dozen hurricanes with no loss to themselves. Two of LLV-24's pilots, Lieutenant Nisanin and Lieutenant Pekuri, both were credited with three hurricanes in this action, while another two were shot down by Sergeant Patola, fighter number BW-379. The DB-3 bombers used in this raid were another of the advanced mid-30s designs produced by the Soviet Union, who here, as with their contemporary fighters, were among the world's leaders in aeronautical design. This Ilyushin design was a counterpart to the other major Soviet twin-engine bomber of the late interwar period, the Tupolev SB. The initial models, which appeared in 1935, used license-built Nolmoron radial engines, known in the Soviet nomenclature as M85s. These were among the first successful two-row radials, with 14 cylinders and capable of an output of about 800 horsepower. Upgraded marks of this engine would be developed by the Russians, which could boost the power to nearly 1,100 horsepower by 1940. In consequence, the DB was fast, like the SB, capable of 275 miles per hour, or about 445 kph, slightly slower than the SB and not far from the top speed of the Brewster fighter, the finished version of which could make just under 300 miles per hour, or about 480 kph. Like the SB had been just a few years prior, it was perhaps the best aircraft of its type when it entered squadron service in 1937. However, the DB was difficult to produce, using cutting-edge design and production methods, meaning that it would be outnumbered by the SB. Another battle of 239s versus Hurricanes took place on the 8th of June, when five of the Finnish planes attacked three Hurricanes over the Murmansk Railroad near the landing field at Kesa not far from the southern shore of Lake Rukajari. Ten more hurricanes joined the battle, and in the hectic dogfight that followed, the Finns shot down five of their opponents. This time the victory was not gained without loss, however. One of their 239s, serial number BW394, was shot down over the lake. The pilot, Lieutenant Uro Levi Alvesello, crash-landed his burning machine and escaped from the wreckage managed to evade capture and return to friendly territory. One more big battle between Brewsters and Hurricanes would take place in June. On the 25th of that month, 10 Brewsters from the 3rd and 4th flights met about 15 Hurricanes over Lake C.S. Jarvi. Finns once again took a toll on the Russians. Some of this battle took place, untypically, at altitudes above 5,000 meters. And the impairment of the 239's performance at altitude vis-a-vis -vis the British machine became apparent. The outnumbered Finns shot down four of their opponents. However, two Finns were also shot down in this battle, an up till now unprecedented outcome for LLV-24. One of these, BW-372, was flown by Sergeant Kalevi Antilla, while the other was piloted by Lieutenant Laurie Ohukainen. Both of these fighters, significantly, were flying top cover above 5,000 meters or 16,000 feet when they were bounced by five enemy planes. Okuhainen saw Antilla's plane hit and its engine knocked out. As Antilla's aircraft glided away to the west, trying to make the finish lines, Okuhainen's was hit by fire from a pair of hurricanes. His Brewster burning from hits in his fuel tanks, Finn dove for a small lake 15 kilometers, or about 9 miles, north of Lake Kalitsin. He describes it thus, quote, Flying at 250 kph at a height of just 10 meters, I pushed the nose of the fighter over and hit the lake hard, flipping the Brewster over onto its back. I dived out of the inverted machine and swam ashore. The fighter sank in just 30 seconds. After walking some 20 kilometers, I reached a finished outpost south of Lake Jelmozero. Troops here had seen one of my hurricanes crash, starting a forest fire where it hit the ground. These losses were worrying, and suggested that Soviet air opposition may become more formidable as the Russians became more familiar with the Hurricanes, and as they ran out of the less capable mid-30s designs that had filled their squadrons up till now. It also suggested that the Soviets could pose a grave problem for the 239 pilots by using the newer fighters at a higher altitude. Though troubling, 
Losses suffered by LLV-24 were balanced by the 45 hurricanes claimed destroyed by its pilots in the preceding six months. After the battle on the 25th, air operations over the Karelian Front would enter a period of comparative inactivity. With the return of comparatively moderate weather, the bulk of the Soviet air strength in the region was shifted north to the Arctic Sea coast, where it was used to protect the Allied convoys bringing supplies and weapons to the Arctic ports of Murmansk and Archangel. In the meantime, the official abbreviation of Lentil Ivu, Finnish for Fighter Squadron, was officially changed and Squadron LLV-24 became Squadron LELV-24. In July, Master Sergeant Lori Niesenen who had scored his 20th kill of the Continuation War in the fight against the Hurricanes on the 8th, became the second of the squadron's pilots to be awarded the Mannerheim Cross. In the second half of that month, the squadron was deployed away from the Olenets to Xjari area, stations further south, to guard the Karelian Front and the coast of the Gulf of Finland. And that, I think, is where I will end this video. I hope you found some of what I had to say here informative or otherwise interesting. And I hope you'll join me for the next part of this series. Thanks for watching, and I appreciate your interest and support. It makes my life a lot better. So, until next time, I remain Mark7, wishing you all the best.